Uh, my name is uh, Fredrik. Uh, I come from southern Sweden and I'm here today to talk about uh, how we can use uh, Julia for control systems analysis and design. Uh, I work for a company called Julia Hub. It uh, was founded, uh, founded uh, a couple of years ago under the name of Julia Computing, but was uh, recently rebranded to align with our uh, main product, uh, which is a cloud compute platform. Uh, so we provide such a platform where you can run your Julia code and so on. And on that platform, we also provide a product called Julia Sim, which is a modeling and simulation uh, suite of tools. And within that suite of tools, we have a lot of control systems tools, which I'm part of developing. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the more general package landscape in the Julia programming languages, what uh, packages exist out there for solving control systems analysis and design uh, problems. Uh, we will have a look at the demo of the control systems package, which is perhaps the most uh, basic uh, package you would be using if you want to do your standard control analysis and design. Uh, we will look at the little demo of modeling toolkit, which is a modeling language if you want to model more sophisticated uh, plant models um, uh, in an ACOSL equation based modeling language. We will then briefly talk about code generation, which is something that's quite interesting to control engineers, uh, where we actually take uh, our Julia code and in some way or another make it run on some hardware that we are interested in, which may or may not be your your typical laptop uh, piece of kit. Uh, we will also talk briefly about uh, can we actually control hardware using Julia programs and so on. All right, we have a landscape of control packages in Julia. I hope uh, it's legible for everyone here. On the far left uh, in blue, we have the Julia control uh, GitHub organization. It's open source. Everything is freely available under the MIT license. The main package is uh, called the control systems, uh, but there is also something called control systems base, which is a lighter weight package uh, that has fewer features, but is much significantly faster to load. Uh, that contains all your standard uh, transfer function implementations, state space models. If you want to plot things like Bode plots and Nyquist plots, you find that uh, there. We have a package called Robust and Optimal Control. It's a kind of an extension package to control systems. It contains your H-Infinity robust control, uh, uncertainty modeling, uh, basic functionality for computed, computing structured singular values. And we will see a slight demo of some features related to that uh, here today as well. We have a system identification package if you want to run stuff like subspace based identification or the prediction error method to estimate uh, a linear uh, state space model or a transfer function. It also has a lot of uh, frequency domain uh, methods. And we have we have a couple of additional packages in that uh, under that umbrella as well that you can check out. And then in the center of the screen we have in red the kind of SciML ecosystem and uh, those of you who were here uh, half a year ago heard uh, Chris Rokakis talk about this in general in, in depth that's an enormous organization and there is a lot of stuff under that umbrella here I just mentioned the kind of the main packages that are relevant for a control engineer so so we have of course differential equations which itself is an umbrella package for a lot of different differential equation solvers uh, and the uh, differential equations could be any kind of differential equation. We have your ordinary uh, differential equation or your uh, DAEs, differential algebraic equations, uh, PD, partial, uh, delay differential equations, stochastic differential equations. It's all covered under that umbrella. And there is a very large uh, selection of solvers that you can make use of. Uh, we then have modeling toolkit, which is our modeling language. Uh, once again, that is free and, and open source. You can build your models using that. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Modelica, it's similar in spirit to Modelic. It's an equation based language rather than an input output based language like uh, Simulink, for instance. And that is relevant for control engineers, not only because you can build uh, models of physical systems slightly easier, but you can also do things like uh, it, it's very trivial to compute an inverse model. So a, a forward model takes inputs and simulates and produces outputs. But what if you have a desired output and you want to compute what input should I send to the system to, to realize the desired output? That is uh, an inverse model that gives you that. And if you have an A-causal modeling language, it's trivial to invert uh, the model. 
Whereas if you have an input output based language, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, we also have a modeling toolkit standard library uh, that contains pre-made model components that you can just assemble. And we will use many of those components in the demo today. Uh, in the far right of the screen, we have a green organization here, Julia Reach, uh, that contains a lot of features for something called reachability analysis. So if we have a linear control system, we have a lot of uh, a rich set of tools to analyze robustness and stability and performance and stuff like that. Uh, but for nonlinear systems, uh, we are much more handicapped. It's much more difficult to, to analyze such system. And a reachability analysis is a one a suite of tools that is generally applicable. And it does a computation with sets. So for instance, imagine that your initial condition uh, belongs to some set. Maybe it's a sphere or a rectangle or something like that. And your parameters are maybe also a bit uncertain, but they belong to some other set. All right. And reachability analysis propagates these sets through a simulation. So you will obtain kind of a posterior set, if you will. That's not really accurate language, but it allows you to propagate your uncertain sets through a simulation. And that allows you to say things like, yeah, please, I want to guarantee that uh, my robot does not crash into the wall. OK, does my uh, final set overlap with the wall? Yes or no. And if it does, uh, you need to reconsider your controller or your trajectory planner, perhaps. So there is a lot of uh, features under that umbrella as well. But we also have some optimal control packages. And when I say optimal control, I mean open loop optimal control. Uh, we have a particle filter library called low level particle filters that contains also stuff like Kalman filtering and unscented extended Kalman filters, stuff like that. There are actually several packages in the Julia ecosystem that implements all of these things. Um, low level particle filters is just happen to be the one uh, we use at Julia Hub. And then we have the Julia Sim control ecosystem. So that's actually a part of the uh, Julia Hub platform and the Julia Sim offering. So that is proprietary, uh, but it, there is a standard tier that is freely available. The limitation is that you can use a limited number of hours uh, compute per month. And there we offer a lot of extended functionality that is built uh, on top of the Julia control and the SIML ecosystem. So things like model predictive control is part of that offering. But there is also a lot of other different bits and pieces scattered across the Julia ecosystem that is useful for a control engineer. So I mentioned some of them here. Uh, we have some of Squares programming. Uh, so some of Squares programming is a convex uh, set of techniques that allow you to search for Lyapunov functions for nonlinear systems, uh, in particular if you have polynomial uh, systems. So that, that can be translated to a convex problem and that scales poorly with state dimension. But if you have a reasonably sized uh, state, maybe 10 state components or something like that, you can actually uh, find a Lyapunov function with a computational method. That's quite interesting. Uh, we have a package called convex, which is very similar to CVX in MATLAB or com CVXPy in Python. Uh, from the Stanford group, uh, Stephen Boyd, it's a convex mathematical modeling language. Uh, we have jump, which is a similar thing in Julia, but not only for convex, but for general nonlinear programming also. Uh, we have rigid body dynamics and a whole other uh, suite of tools that might be useful. But uh, for the purposes of today's presentation, we'll focus on the blue and the red pieces on this screen. So I will start with uh, two small uh, demos. Uh, if you uh, access the slides, I sent the link in the Teams uh, channel. Uh, you can find these uh, notebooks. Uh, you can also scan the QR code here, and that takes you to a hosted version of, of this notebook, so you can follow along. Uh, let's see. All right, I hope that is legible. This is a Pluto notebook. It's similar to Jupyter notebooks, but uh, slightly different in, in that it's reactive. So as soon as I change something, everything is recomputed automatically. Um, and what I do here is I load the control system BEX package. And I also load a plotting package, a linear algebra standard library, and a, a package called Pluto UI. Pluto UI provides some interactive graphical user elements that I can sliders and stuff that I can modify. Uh, my control design in, in the notebook here. The first little uh, thing I do here is I call a function TF. If you're familiar with the control system packages from other uh, similar languages, uh, you might uh, recognize that. That creates a transfer function, the kind of 
most basic dynamical systems model we might use as control engineers. It takes a numerator and a denominator and it produces a transfer function object. So nothing strange there. It works uh, the way you're used to. If you want to produce a Boda plot, you type Boda plot and you pass in that transfer function. So, so far, nothing strange. It's, it's uh, what you would expect. And the same for a Nyquist plot. It, it looks very similar. Uh, but now we come to some perhaps more interesting feature. Here we're going to simulate an LQR controller. I have added two sliders here. So these are defined in the Pluto UI package. One is for R, which is the penalty matrix for the control action here in my LQR uh, problem. And I can uh, modify this slider and we see that the simulation changes. And the other is the disturbance magnitude. So I simulate the disturbance step happening here after two and a half seconds. So this kind of interactive graphical user elements is quite useful to get the rough feeling and intuition for your system. What if I change the parameter? How does the system behave? And it's uh, as long as your simulation is not sluggish, uh, you get kind of an interactive feeling here. And we will see later where we actually, we can add whatever plot we want here. We can add a Boda plot and a Nyquist plot, and we can look at the gang of four and see how, how our stability margins change as we change our, perhaps our controller parameters. Uh, what do I do in this code block here? I have a sample time. I have a dynamics matrix uh, A, B, and C, and I package that into the SS. So that might also be familiar. It creates a state space system. Uh, here I define a penalty matrix, and this R penalty matrix was set by the slider up here. So that's not visible in the code. And then uh, I create, instead of creating a sampled control signal input, I create a little function here. So U is the function of the state and the time. And we see that it's, it's a linear state feedback here with a feedback gain I got from LQR. Uh, but then also if T is greater than a 2.0, uh, so this t greater than 2.0, it evaluates to a boolean, true or false, and that's an integer, 0 or 1, and I multiply that with a disturbance magnitude. So after 2.5 seconds, there is a disturbance entry. So this is kind of a, you can use this interface to, to the simulation library to implement uh, basic simulations, uh, step responses, ramp responses, state feedback, you know, and stuff like that. Then everything else is kind of basic. Here is an initial state. I call the lsim function for linear simulation. I pass in all the stuff I've created before, and I get some, some vectors or some arrays out, and I can plot them. And that produces this little plot. All right, uh, but we can do more interesting things when we work in the Julia programming language. Uh, here I, uh, imp I load a package called Monte Carlo measurements. And what that does is it provides a data type that behaves like a regular number, say a floating point value, but it really represents a probability distribution uh, using samples. So hence the, the name Monte Carlo there. So you can imagine that you run Turing uh, that we tour, uh, spoke about in the previous presentation, and you get a uh, posterior distribution over your parameters. Uh, you can represent those parameters as such number types. Uh, but here I just create, I say I have a parameter k, and its value is 1 plus minus sigma k, and sigma k happen to be defined by this slider here. And the same for this zeta and omega. And then I just create a transfer function with these uncertain values here. And now we see that the transfer function is it's printed like this. So the, the numerator is 0 0.8 plus minus 0 0.3. So this is kind of an uncertain system. Uh, and the, the Julia uh, control package doesn't know anything about uncertainty, really. It just knows about basic numbers. And uh, you can pass in a basic floating point number there, and that works as expected. But you can also pass in an uncertain number, and it still works. And you could pass in a symbolic value there from SymPy or Symbolics, and that would also work. Uh, so by changing these sliders, now I can change the probability distributions of my parameters, and the, we see them here. Uh, but a more interesting, perhaps, is that I can compute the DC gain. So that's the, the, the gain of the system at frequency zero. And it says it's 1 plus minus 0 0.11. And 0 0.11, because my uh, k value was, the uncertainty was 0 0.11. So this DC gain function, it just understood 
uncertain numbers. And that's not because I have told DC Gain how, how to handle uncertain numbers. It's just because the way the Julia programming language work, it just accepts anything that behaves like a number and it just performs the computations. So that's quite useful. And you can visualize the, the DC Gain, uh, the distribution of the DC Gain. Uh, but we can also do things like plot the border plot here. So here I call, I create the frequency vector. It's logarithmically spaced. I call Bode, and then I plot that error bar plot. I get a plot of error bars. So this is now the uncertainty in my Bode curve. Uh, if I prefer, I can plot the individual samples instead. So here we see that I have, uh, I think I have a hundred samples or something uh, that represents my uncertainty, but I could have any number of samples really. Uh, so if I bring my my sliders with me down here in the notebook. Uh, let's see if I can bring them down. Uh, yep. Uh, if I change the gain, the uncertainty in the gain, we see that now I have a bigger uncertainty here for low frequencies. If I set the uncertainty to zero, we see I'm completely certain for low frequencies, but the, uh, the resonant peak there is uncertain. If I reduce the uncertainty in the frequency, now I only have uncertainty in the relative damping, so I have an uncertainty in the the size of the peak, right? So this is very useful. Very often we have some parametric uncertainty and we want to analyze this system. And this is a quick and dirty way to, to do it. Then you can formalize the, uh, this with more formal methods, but very often a quick intuition is very useful to get. And you can use this with differential equations also. You can pass these number types through the differential equation solvers and it still works and pr produces a distribution over your simulation. Would that be, be similar to using this uh, ensemble method? Yes, the ensemble method would probably be more efficient, uh, but they compute the same thing. Uh, modulo, if you have an adaptive step size solver, uh, it would take a, a single step for all realizations if you use this number type, whereas if you use an ensemble, it will use different adaptation for dif uh, different trajectories. So yes, the ensemble method is what you uh, should do if you're very careful and you want to simulate a lot efficiently. Uh, but this is a very quick and intuitive way to work with uncertain numbers. All right, so this little demo just showed that the control package interacts with other packages in the Julia ecosystem. So we have one package that provides uncertain numbers, and we have one package that provides some control system functionality, and you can put one into the other and you can very often expect it to work. And other cases where you can expect things to work is we have uh, tools in Julia for automatic differentiation. So that's what Tor spoke about. You need the gradient of your uh, log likelihood, right, to sample using the, the Turing package or many of the samplers. And in Julia, it's, it's very easy to get that gradient because you have automatic differentiation of almost arbitrary Julia code. That is very useful for control system design as well. Very often, uh, we, uh, if we want to tune something and it's not the most trivial system, we might want to use some optimization-based method to tune. And then perhaps we want to specify some constraints on our sensitivity functions and we want proper margins and we want, uh, high, we want to optimize the performance and so on. And that can quickly become very nasty. And historically, we have limited ourselves to something, to easy simulations and easy constraints where we can figure out the the gradients uh, on a piece of paper. But nowadays, we don't have to limit ourselves to that. We can just, if we can compute it, uh, we can get the gradient for free. I say for free, I mean that we don't need to hand derive the gradient. We still need to perform additional computations, of course. All right, uh, the next little demo is how we can use the uh, modeling toolkit uh, modeling language for uh, control systems uh, work. So. Uh, yeah, this figure is a bit small. I will try to explain it. Um, very often we we spend significant time as control engineers to come up with a very good and accurate model of our system, the system we want to control. Maybe it's an oil field, maybe it's a chemical processing plant, maybe it's an airplane. A lot of time goes into that model. And that is represented by the red block uh, to the far left. That's your high fidelity, in this case, modeling toolkit model. But then for a control design, very often we perhaps linearize that model around a certain operating point or several. And then we're in the kind of the blue domain, the linear control system analysis and design domain. We might do some control design there. We verify some robustness and we iterate a bit back and forth. And then we 
Uh, before we are happy, we uh, verify on the nonlinear system, and very often we verify in terms of yeah, simulation. We simulate and see does it behave the way we expected when we actually try it against the nonlinear model. And uh, if it does, then we're happy. Then perhaps we want to generate some uh, C code or at least some kind of native code that can run on the hardware that actually controls the system. And then uh, we are happy for now. Then, of course, we need to validate and all of that stuff on the actual hardware. Uh, but for today, we will uh, look at this workflow to go from a nonlinear model uh, to linear control design and then nonlinear verification. So if you uh, look at the slides, there is a video that uh, goes into this in a bit more depth than we have time to do today. Uh, what I do here is I load a bunch of packages, modeling toolkit, control systems, uh, differential equations, uh, plots, and so on, and modeling toolkit standard library. So that's a, a package with a lot of pre-built components that you can use to, to assemble your system model. We're going to build this overarching uh, feedback system. We have a process P, it's a DC motor, and we have a controller C, it's a PI controller. And the process P, if we look inside that uh, box, uh, and we have an electrical part here to the left with a voltage source that generates a current through a resistor and an inductor. And then there is an electromotorical force here that transfers the electrical domain into the mechanical domain. And here we have a shaft and an inertia. All right, so those are mechanical components. So I have written a little function called motor. It uh, creates components from uh, modeling toolkit standard library. So here is the ground, electrical ground. There is a voltage, uh, resistor, inductor, all of the things you saw in the picture above. And then it uh, forms a bunch of connections. So these connect statements here, they essentially form the, the lines you see in this figure here. All right, and uh, without going into too much detail of the syntax here, uh, after we have done all of this, we get the motor. All right, and that creates the the block P here. And now we're going to create the block C and create the feedback interconnection. So uh, we create, we now instantiate our motor. Uh, we then create the blocks.step. So that's just the step function that will serve as uh, our reference. Uh, we create the PI controller, so that uh, is called limited PI because it has uh, anti-wind-up and, and saturation. And we create the feedback node and another step for a disturbance and then a speed sensor. And then we form all the connections in the feedback uh, diagram. And we can simulate that. Uh, it looks like this. It's very quick here in the beginning. We have an initial transient with some overshoot. And then here after a while, there is a step disturbance. All right. And I the, the PI uh, parameters, the gain and the uh, integration time here, I've, I've uh, made some sliders for those. So we can see that if I uh, make the proportional gain slower, it becomes sluggish. And if I uh, use too much gain, it, we have an overshoot. All right. So I can tune my PI controller using these sliders. And then, uh, yeah, maybe I'm happy there. And I progress. Now I have performed kind of an uh, PI controller tuning using a model. Uh, but we know that the model is uh, not particularly accurate. So when I take this to my uh, real system, will it actually work? Uh, who knows? We can try to do some uh, robustness analysis before we actually go and uh, implement it on our real motor. And to do that, we might want to do look at something like the sensitivity function. So if uh, P is our process and C is our controller, the output sensitivity function is 1 over 1 plus PC. All right. We can easily compute that. I just say get sensitivity. And in what point do I want the sensitivity? In the output. OK, and I call the output Y above when I uh, form my connection. That gives me a bunch of matrices, A, B, C, and D matrices for a state space model. So I can put that into the SS command. And now I have a state space system that corresponds to my sensitivity function. So I can do things like, what is the H infinity norm of that sensitivity function? It's 1.38. Yeah, it's not great, it's not terrible, but at least it gives some of us a sense of the, the expected robustness uh, of this system. We can plot it. So here we have the simulation on top. We have our sensitivity function uh, on the bottom left. With a peak here, we computed with H infinity norm. And then I plotted a Nyquist plot here of the loop transfer function. And there is a circle that corresponds to the, the circle has a radius that is the inverse of the peak of the sensitivity function. So 
with our modeling toolkit model, we could uh, very easily perform such a, uh, a simulation and we could ask for a sensitivity function. And what that does is actually it linearizes the system underneath the hood. And it linearizes if you don't specify the operating point in which you want to linearize, it uses the default value that is specified in the model. And that gives you a linear system you can uh, use to perform linear robotness analysis like you are used to from basic control. All right, and then uh, we might want to uh, just linearize part of the model. We can do that. So here I have my motor. I call the linearize function. I say uh, this, uh, these two are my inputs. So when you linearize, consider this my inputs and this is my output. And that gives me an A matrix B, C and D that I can, that correspond to my linear. Oh, that display doesn't, okay, here we have them. So we can go between linear and nonlinear here uh, rather easily. Uh, yeah, we can also, that gives us a state space system without any names. Uh, so if we actually want to retain all of the, the state uh, components and the inputs and outputs, they actually have names in this nonlinear model. Uh, we can also call something called named SS and that retains the name. So that produces here a named state space that has uh, state names and input and output names. Uh, so if we plot a border plot of that, we get a helpful label that says this is a border plot from source voltage to load flange angle, All right? Okay, so with the nonlinear uh, high fidelity model, in this case, it was a low fidelity model, but you can easily imagine that you add much more fidelity to, to a model of the motor. Uh, we can, uh, that seamlessly interacts with a control system packages through linearization in this case. Um, all right. So if you want to access these slides, uh, they are available here in this GitHub repository, or if you click these links in the, the slides um, online. All right. The next topic I would like to talk about is estimation and identification. And estimation is a kind of, uh, these two are almost synonyms. When I say estimation, I mean uh, state estimation typically. And when I say identification, I mean that we want to identify a model of a dynamical system. We have a package called uh, control system identification. It's, it's, it contains all your standard system identification methods from, from linear SysID. So if you think about uh, Lennart Jung's book, uh, it covers most of that. So you have your subspace-based identification, several different variants there, and the prediction error method. Uh, the prediction error method is an interesting kind of, uh, it's the most, to me, the most intuitive identification method. So what does it do? It forms a predictor and then it simulates the system forward in time and, and you get prediction errors. So you compare your simulation with the, uh, the data you have available. And that gives you prediction errors, and then you essentially want to minimize those prediction errors. And how do you do that? Uh, typically, you do that uh, by uh, some form of gradient descent, or and maybe you even use second order information. So you do Newton's method on that. And if you look in a typical system identification book, there is page after page deriving the gradients for uh, the prediction error method. But I say here that you can easily write this yourself, and you don't even need to look in those books. So we're going to go and actually look at the implementation here. All right, so here is, let me make that larger. Here is the implementation, it's called new prediction error method because there is an old one. <laughs> uh, it takes a bunch of arguments, we don't need to uh, worry about those, so those are just options. What I want to focus on is, uh, here we have the loss functions. So there are two different loss functions. We can have focus on prediction or focus on simulation. And for now, to make it easy, we focus on simulation. So what happens here? The simulation loss takes in the parameter vector. So this is just a one dimensional vector of all the parameters in our model. We call a vec to model that just takes the parameter vector and creates a state space system on a particular param uh, parameterization. That gives us this state space system and also uh, an initial condition, initial state. All right, then we call lsim. So that just simulates the system forward in time. And then uh, y is our data. So we say metric uh, 
we, we compute the error between the simulation here from LSIM and the, the data in the data object D. So this data object is what the user provided. And then for efficiency purposes, I store that back into Y, but you can ignore that. You can consider this, uh, just, this is now the prediction error. All right, and uh, then I, uh, so this metric is perhaps something like uh, the square. That is very common. You you minimize the sum of squares. So then we when we take the sum here, we have already squared the prediction errors. So this is now the minimization of the sum of squares. But then when I call the optimizer here, I say optimize. And what is my cost function? It's either prediction loss or simulation loss. Here is my initial guess for the parameter. Uh, and let's see. Yeah, here I say auto diff equal forward. And that completely eliminates all the pages of reading you would have to do to figure out how do you implement the gradient for, for this uh, prediction error loss. Uh, and even more interesting is that uh, those pages you read in Lennart Jung's book, they tell you that if you have a squared, if you minimize the sum of squared errors, these are the gradients. But here the user can pass in any metric, sum of absolute errors, for instance, then you get a bit of robustness against uh, outliers. Uh, you can easily do that here. You don't have to re-derive any gradients. And this is kind of one of the strengths of using automatic differentiation and more generally differentiable programming. Here I have just written a regular Julia program and uh, Autodiff takes care of finding the gradient for me. So this is incredibly powerful. If you think about modern deep learning uh, frameworks such as uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, uh, what they are is essentially automatic differentiation engines. They allow you to specify a very particular kind of model, so a deep neural network, and provided you specify the model using their tools, they can compute the derivative for you. And that's very useful, but what if your model is not a, different, uh, not a deep neural network? What if it's a simulation of a control system? Or even worse, what if it's a simulation of a control system that controls a partial differential equation system? You can easily see how that becomes nasty to, to use PyTorch to, you would have to re-implement the PD solver in PyTorch and you would probably not do it very efficiently. Uh, but in Julia, uh, automatic differentiation comes almost for free. So I don't want to give you the impression that it's always trivial, it isn't. You need to know uh, roughly how to write good and efficient Julia code so that it's amenable to automatic differentiation. Uh, but that's fairly easy to do. So most uh, experienced Julia programmers, they instinctively write code in that way. And if you run into an, a problem, uh, it's usually quite straightforward to, to fix. So you, you can actually derive gradients quite easy. All right. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, this uh, system identification package also contains stuff like uh, arcs models uh, auto regressive with external input so that estimates transfer functions and, and things like that and, and some frequency domain estimation methods uh, the state estimation library low level particle filters it has uh, even though it's called particle filters it also has common filters and some nonlinear variants of those so there is a, a ukf uncentered comma filter and ekf extended comma filter and this is once again a link the extended comma filter uh, it the, it linearizes the nonlinear system in each iteration and then it uses kind of the standard comma filtering update equations so how do you think we linearize the system here and uh, let's have a look and uh, here's that code and it obtains the a matrix by calling forward diff so that's automatic differentiation uh, the alternative would be that uh, you let the user provide the Jacobian. Okay, that you can do that for simple systems, but if you have a nasty nonlinear system, it's error prone and tedious to write the Jacobian function. And the other alternative is that you use finite differences, uh, but uh, that is actually notoriously uh, numerical, uh, prone to numerical errors. So you need to be actually very careful when you use finite differences for extended comma filtering. But with automatic differentiation, you get the uh, an accurate uh, Jacobian for, for free here. And the same down here in the correction step where we get the, the C matrix. So this automatic differentiation is useful not only when you want to optimize something and you want to get a gradient for gradient descent. It's also useful when you want to linearize a dynamical system, for instance. All right. 
let's see here. If you would like to, uh, so, so far we have spoken a lot about linear dynamical systems. Uh, if you have written a nonlinear uh, model, maybe using modeling toolkit, or maybe you have uh, handwritten the the um, nonlinear uh, ordinary differential equation code, uh, you can differentiate through that also. So maybe you want to fit some parameters in your OD. Uh, you can easily do that. Uh, simulate, compute the uh, cost function that compares the simulation with some data, and then derive the gradient through that automatically. And there are some tools in this package, DFEQ Flux, to help you uh, do that efficiently. It turns out there is actually a lot of different ways you can compute the gradient automatically through a, a differential equation solver. And which one is best depends on the properties of your system and so on. So this package helps you to use a lot of different methods that fit your, your model the best. All right, I don't know if we had scheduled a little break here. Yeah, in five minutes or something. All right. If, if it suits you to take it now, we can do that. We can we can take one more slide and then we can maybe have a break. Yeah. So model predictive control, uh, maybe show of hands how many are familiar with MPC before? Yeah, okay, almost everyone actually. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, for the audience, uh, remote audience, if there is someone who is not familiar, it's a, maybe perhaps an advanced uh, control scheme where you use the model to simulate forward in time, and then you try to optimize uh, your control actions so that your simulation looks uh, the best you can. And then you take uh, one step of your control action trajectory, and then you obtain some new data. Maybe you measure the system and you realize that uh, things were not the way you thought in your simulation, and now you need to redo the optimization, and you keep on doing that uh, each time step. So this is a uh, quite intuitive uh, control method, but it's obviously very computationally expensive, and it also requires a model. It's model-based. Uh, but uh, if you implement that in uh, Julia, you at least take out one uh, piece of headache, which is deriving the, the gradients. And typically, we don't only need the gradients when we do MPC. We might also need some constraint Jacobians, and we must have maybe Hessians. So we can do second order uh optimization because uh, we are running this in closed loop we need the the optimization to converge uh, very fast and if we want something to converge very fast uh, second order information is very helpful and uh, you can do that quite easily so there are a few packages that help you so jump.jl is one such package it's a general purpose mathematical modeling language uh, so it's not specialized at all for for mpc but uh, you can formulate mpc problems there if you want um, uh, we at Julia Hub offer Julia Sim control. Uh, we have a kind of an extensive model predictive control package there. Uh, we build on top of modeling toolkit, of course, uh, but also uh, an kind of an umbrella optimizer called optimization.jl. So in Julia, there are tons and tons of uh, optimizers. And optimization.jl is kind of an umbrella that puts them all under the same user interface. So we allow the user to select uh, not any solver, but any solver that is compatible with your uh, problem specification. And we implement some things like robust MPC if you have uncertain systems and, and we can handle integer variables. So for instance, if your uh, compressor is uh, on or off, but you can't control the speed of it, that's an integer variable or a bo Boolean variable perhaps. Uh, that's a bit more difficult than a traditional optimization where you only have real variables, but uh, there is quite sophisticated tools available today and we can make use of them so we can solve such MPC problems also. And if we have time uh, in the end of today, we will look at a demo of uh, such an MPC problem. Uh, but there are a few other packages also, I list a few of them here. Uh, model predictive control.jl is a quite a moder a recent effort, but it's starting to look quite comprehensive. And then there is a contact implicit MPC, which is quite special purpose for robots that make contact with their environment and so on. But there are a few others also if you if you search the corners of the internet. All right. Uh, yes, maybe this is a good okay. time for a little break. Okay. There is still some coffee and, and chocolate and fruit. Yep. Uh, well, I think 
then the reason why they're not they're so they're in the kind of dependency of like an 86 or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's on the PhD student, on the master students in the continue. So yep. And then down here in like two, actually in 1990, and we've got a course of dependency since then. Oh, I see, I see. That's so you're well versed in that. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So we had a student that is on what a dependency on the well, um, management uh -huh. in a weeds uh, lake. Yep. Well, the predictions uh, yeah. the prognosis are different by 50 different prognosis. Yeah. yeah. My colleague is very good at that. I guess project that was at the other bus. Yeah, as MPC on order to extend it. I'll have to not take the other day. Det kommer mycket, speciellt det här med robust NPC, ser jag som en ganska viktig komponent för att det har på något sätt varit mycket, man måste lära sig ganska mycket för att kunna använda NPC på ett bra sätt, man måste hantera det här, dels optimeringen ska konvergera och sen ska det vara en stabiliserande data också för att man ska gå upp i nytt och sånt, och det är då att det blir ganska svårt för en användare som inte är expert på NPC att använda det. Ja, jo, nej, hon tar det in och vi tänder den och så får vi den här delen för att vara för stort. Ja, just det. Ja, precis. Ja. Jo, det är ett smitt. Så kan man använda det så är det inte så bra. Ja. Eller så har jag ju jävla hade en test. Du får bara en dag. Du kör ju och det är bara små minuter i tid. Ja, det är bara skrym då. Ja, det är så. Det är väldigt tidigt som helst. Det är så stort. Yep. Jo, jag har varit på Jim Rawlings och Moritz Deal i Frankfurt och från hade en NBC som en skola där som jag hade flera gånger. Men jag var på 2015 och det var väldigt trevligt. Men intuitivt var det en basis sen för det var också enkelt att förstå. Ja visst, men det var det jag hade. Det är bara en sån grej som att du har en finit horisont och sen ska du försöka fånga kostnaden av resten av oändliga ting. Det är jättesvårt att veta om man ska stoppa in det, om det inte är just det här systemet. Ja, det ska vara en men du kan se en Youtube-bin. Ja, det är en stil. 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 Först som en bröd. Okej, då håller jag. Det är så trött. Det är det vi gör. Det är så att vi har ju 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 så att v
Då är det nya system kan man det explicit att se hur du har det. Ja, ja. Då är det piecewise. Det är väldigt länge. Precis. Men för olika system så har du ingen sån. Nej. Men man kan använda lite maskinlärning för att lära sig en sån. Ja. Om du inte har för stor tillståndsspräng. Säg att du har kanske 10-20 tillståndskomponenter. Och att du har en dag för många insignaler och så. Mm. Då kan man göra det ganska noggrant. Mm. Och då blir ju en C-regulation så snabbt som helst. Ja, ja. Och då kan du ha, då kan du tillåta dig själv att ha väldigt lång horisont för att du löser problemet. Har du börjat med något primet? Vi har en avgåsinne. Physics in form, you are Ja, kanske. Jag vet inte. Nej, jag tror att man behöver. Ja, för att... Allt vi tar det är som traditionell NPC. Vi tar ju själv en kontriagens kontrikt. Ja. Så är det ju en hård som du upp. Men vi tar brukar ha en kontriagens kontrikt. Ja, det är men om du tänker om du ser en C-regulatorn som den definierar egentligen bara en funktion som tar den helt statisk funktion. Ja. Om du flyttar ut observerat, som jag ser till fyra man flyttar och så. Ja. Om du flyttar det utanför en C-regulator, det är ju ett dynamiskt system. Ja. Men en C-regulator som löser optimeringsproblemet, det är en statisk funktion som tar tillstånd och producerar en stor signal. Ja. Det är bara det den är definierad implicit genom lösningen till ett optimeringsproblem. Ja. Vi kör det är en fast typ av normal matematisk regel. Okej, ja. Jag tror lite på det. Alltså, det är framför att du kommer till en del av funktionen som är en del av funktionen. Okej. Och lösningen är nästan en klass. Nu är det en del av funktionen. Ja, nu är det en del av funktionen. Då får du en perfekt lösning. Och just på en lösning, det är som en med film och så tror jag att det har det på en mål. Men jag vet inte om det fungerar med constraints. Nej, det är det som är. Att det är väldigt svårt att hantera bivillkoder. Jag tror att det här med att det här med att Men annars så, det är likadant med löparna av metoder som letar efter löparna. Du kan använda neural löparna. Du kan hitta sådana löparna, men det är väldigt svårt att hantera bivillkoder. Och sen med löpande av funktionerna så har du också inte någon riktig känsla för din prestanda. Löpande av funktionerna säger att ja, det är stabilt. Mm. Men vad har du för marginaler om man får fram vad som är lite svårare att känsla på det där? Det kommer en där var väldigt glad i han fåtrar på Bode och Nichols kriterier och inte Nyquist. Det är att man syns att det är en principiell att få tolka på den här kvisten. Det är en gäng också för att vi ska det här. Den har faktiskt alltid mycket att se gång. Ja, visst. Men det finns inte gör det. Jo, det finns det, men den är lite buggig om jag skulle helt ärlig. Eller det som är buggigt är... Att rita en nikolskurva är inte så svårt, ja. men du vill gärna ha de här stödlinjerna. Ja, det där konstigt. Ja, ja. Och de ser lite konstigt ut när det Ja, nej, nej, nej. Du kan ju bara undvika den här bordet och så kan du bara... Ja, ja. En sån metod som tillsammansätt av som är populär i en del kretsar där är en sån filter. Ja. Jag har inte implementerat det, men det finns det, 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 det finns ett paket som heter en sån Ja. Men så du har så du har en sån där som du har en sån där som du har en sån där som en sån där som du har en sån där som du som finns kvar en sån där som du har 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 en
Nej, men det finns. Jag har inte själv använt det, men jag ser aldrig så jag vet inte. Nej, jag får inte det är enkelt att det är nästan samma som det är snabbt. Jag tror vi har implementerat något. Man kan se det också som ett artikelfilter där du approximerar posteriorfördelningen hela tiden igen. Men han har också vidareutvecklat det lite och sagt att det är en normal konvertit för en game som liksom skriver för en motnad. Det är en slags säkerhet som är en sök. Ja, okej. Vi ska inte ta på science. Det är en sån här del av det. Exactly. <laughs> Dynamiska system så har vi den naturliga att det fungerar fram till tiden. Kan man utnyttja den strukturen så kan man göra mycket mer effektivt än man gör som det här med Tony Mottikal. Det är effektivt på den här modellen. Men om du har den här strukturen i tiden så kan du inte vara en mer vi kommer att ha slutat i slutresten av planeten och initiera och simulera på nytt. Okej, okej. Eller så kan vi också bruka det som en text som är bra för att hålla den och se om det är bra för att hålla den tidigt. Vi har ett sådant här i det paketet. Det är ett sådant här word filtering back at smoking. Så då är det bara att man ska göra med det. Så den plus kombinationen är väldigt lätt att bryta. Vi ska kombinera det med det. Det är väldigt intressant att samsyn. 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 Det är Alltså snart igen då bara. Ja. Han blir med robust. Robust adaptiv MPC. Just det, just det. Bland annat. Robust är okej. Det är något så intressant. Är du klokvarande här? Nej, jag tror inte så. Jag får Har du sysslat med det? Ja, det verkar vara rätt mycket aktivitet på samhället i världen. Men ja, det här är ju inte många av de här som är här. Det är ju den som som man skriver på den här systemet det gör mycket den som var här ju var så inte något det är en konkurs som är ljudiga. Men jag kan tänka mig. 
Jag har inte tänkt på att uppdatera varje sak. Och så får vi läsa lite mer till den bästa. Just för optimering och simulering som finns i väldigt mycket i Julia. Det är ju egentligen ett problem. Det som har varit mest attraktivt än så länge har varit just modellering och simulering och den typen av grejer. Vi vill ju det för att ta det. Det är alltså ett kanske för att ta det här med en team och så. Speciellt optimer, speciellt det finns separata konferenser varje år där det är en konferens som heter Julia. Det är en separat optimeringskonferens, det är bara att handla om vad det är och vad det är. Ja, så det här optimeringskonferensen har varit förut. Nej, den har varit remote nu de senaste åren på grund av covid, men jag ska ge dig när den första gången i juli är den på plats i Europa. Ja, men det är ett rätt stort team med jump, det här modelleringsspråket, det är de som organiserar det. Den gruppen är lite grann lite tid och tid. Ja, då var det inte. Då var det inte intressant. Ja, just för en jävla grej så funkar det ju alldeles snabbt. Du kan skriva lite i olika nya NPC också, men de har vissa begränsningar när det kommer att ha olika nya programmering. Det är lite brökigt att hantera just nu. Så för generellt i olika nya NPC så är det bra att man kanske behöver ha lite grann. Det sker ju utveckling hela tiden, men det har inte skett någon jättestiva förändring med senaste tiden. Så det jag ser fram emot är att de ska förbättra sitt olinjära interface. De har en ganska tråkig begränsning att du kan ha olinjära funktioner men de måste vara skalärare. Så det är inte skalärare. Men om, och väldigt ofta om du har en, en knepig dynamik, alltså ett dynamiskt system, så måste du kanske använda vektoroperationer så att du har lite linjär algebra där igen. Så ja, då funkar inte det. Jag inte det. Det är en tråkig begränsning just nu, men de jobbar på att belyfta den begränsningen så får vi se i framtiden så att det går att Men nu var väl det att det kanske var Ja, så du jobbar med Jag har jobbat hemma från, jag jobbar med i Lyhamn som är baserat i Boston, men jag jobbar hemma i Så de, de har ett kultur i Boston och ett i Indien. Men sen har de en massa anställda ledare av världen egentligen som jobbar hemma från. Ja, det är det. Ja, det är det. det. han är Ja, alltså säger med det är inte ett företag eller något sånt, det är bara en samling av volontärer på något sätt. Så det är det som han gör så att vi Ja, så vi bygger ju bara produkter och ordnar på sig med open source och öppet. Så där kan vem som helst bidra och komma med fullbörjast och kod och sånt här. Så bygger vi produkter och ordnar på det som använder det öppet. Det är så det funkar. Han var väl den som startade den här och säger med organisationen. Så han är där och har varit två år. Men om man kikar, det finns ju hundratals paket där och hundratals folk som var bidrar och fick det. Så det är ju en jättestig effort egentligen. Och då är det bra med att så, så vi får ju väldigt mycket, men alltså, vi, vi på Julia Hub kan bygga våra produkter på väldigt mycket grafisk råd. Och sen har vi den fördelen också att alltså, vi universiteten och så, alltså, kanske inte har tillgång till eh, licens, licensierade produkter och sådana De kan lära sig de här öppna alternativen och sen så eh, när de börjar skriva till industrin så, så kanske de har lite känsla för det och kanske på något av internt företag att man ska göra det för det andra. Vad händer ju också? Vad händer ju det för den väldigt länge att alla universiteter har hand om att de är bra. Det är ett svårt att vi pratar. Jag säger att det inte är ett problem, men vi ser liksom 
Jag har inte sett att man inte har 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 Och så kom min person, men de har ju altså lagt dem, det, det, det er en del som jeg har sett så mye av det, har det veldig vanskelig å, å vinsere, for eksempel, hvis du har en sånn nasjonal instrument, altså en skrit fra nasjonal instrument, ja. for eksempel en dagsist eller noe sånt, ja. så de tror jeg ikke at det er veldig vanskelig å bruke via hans i kjempa da. Ja. Jag kan inte svara på det tyvärr, jag vet inte. Så väldigt ofta så handlar det om, i många fall så har ju tillverkaren av utrustningen försett dig med någon form av interface. Det kanske är tidigare var, det kanske blir till lärflyg eller till matlab kanske. Mm. Nu så händer det ganska mycket att det finns effekt av det. Men det är väldigt sällan tillverkaren har sett dig med interface. Det, det som folk använder idag det är i så fall att de med andra två Det blir en YouTube eller en video. Ja, det är väldigt fint. Så det är väldigt, det är någon annan som måste resa. Men uh, yep. vi spelar in för de som är på nät och de som uh, yep. för uh, YouTube. Okej, okay. let's continue. All right, uh, so now we come to a topic that is of interest to a lot of uh, control engineers, and that's actually controlling some kind of physical piece of equipment. Um, and we have uh, uh, questions such as how do we guarantee some form of real time execution? And here uh, there would be some limitations. So I've uh, spoken so far about a lot of things that are great uh, with Julia. Now we come to some things that are perhaps uh, less great when it comes to the control engineer. So that's something to be aware of. So how do we run uh, Julia code with the real-time guarantees? And the, the real honest answer is that you can't really, right? Uh, so the, the most basic uh, option, uh, which is uh, fine if you run in a student laboratory or if you run uh, controlling a process where the time constant is very long, uh, for perhaps a furnace or something like that. That's just to run uh, Julia and hope for the best. Okay. If you sample every minute, that's perfectly fine to really. Uh, if you sample every 100 times per second, that's perhaps not fine. Uh, most likely not, right? Uh, but uh, as a rule of thumb, if you're in a student lab where it doesn't matter all too much if the ball falls in the floor, uh, you can do this up to 100 hertz roughly with a standard PC. Uh, if you are a bit careful with how you write your Julia code, in particular, make sure that you do not allocate any memory in your hot loop. And uh, then you can easily push this uh, much further. We ran it in the robotics lab at uh, my university at 250 hertz, hard uh, real time. Hard in the sense that the robot would scream violently if we missed the deadline, but uh, soft in the sense that we couldn't actually guarantee anything. Uh, but we did it successfully and we never had any issues, right? But I wouldn't put this on your airplane. Just a quick question. Yep. In the past long time ago, there was some support for a national instrument ducks uh, in UDR. I have no idea, unfortunately. Oh, okay. I was just wondering uh, if you have some hardware or some 
connection or some packages that support uh, logging? Uh, uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, a lot of people who interface this hardware, they actually wrap another interface. So they go uh, the detour through another programming language, uh, often C or, or in some cases also Python. Second quick question. What, how do you store the data? Do you use data frames or something? Uh, that varies a lot. In the robotics lab, we actually uh, stored in just a buffer in memory because the experiments were such that that was not a problem. Uh, but uh, you can imagine storing in a database or on, on disk or something like that also. Uh, the third option that we perhaps would like to achieve is to generate some form of allocation free native code. And when I say native, I mean code that works on your target device, not on your laptop. And that implies some form of uh, cross compilation, unless you're actually fortunate enough to be able to compile on the target, uh, which very often we are not. But uh, this is a, a limitation here. We have been almost no support at all for cross compilation today. Now, Julia is based on LLVM and LLVM exists for a lot of interesting platforms. So in theory, you could take the generated LLV, uh, LLVM code if you produce it for the intended target and then use your existing compiler tool chain from LLVM and down. But there is no facilities to make that easy for you today. So you're currently on your own there and it would be difficult. But however, for a very simple case, simple small Julia programs that satisfy a set of quite strict uh, requirements, you can more or less do that, except for the cross compilation part. But you can produce a small binary that is perhaps a couple of kilobytes large that contains your Julia code and can be executed and interfaced through C and stuff like that. So we will see a few such uh, examples. So uh, if you want to generate C code from a linear time invariant system, that is a very uh, narrow situation, and that is uh, very easy to contain, and we can actually generate C code for that. So that's quite basic. You could write the C code yourself, but this uh, saves you from the hassle. Uh, and the other option is that you use a package in Julia called static compiler that takes your Julia code and writes not C code, but it takes the generated code and packages into a small binary that can be called from C or, or an executable that can be uh, executed from the command line. So if we want to write a C code for a linear system, we can do that. Here I have a small little demo. Uh, we load the control system and symbolic control system packages. I define a bunch of symbols, W, T, and D. And then I create a transfer function with these symbols. So this is just a standard TF command we saw before. I discretize that using the Tustin method, and then I call this function C code. All right, and that just spits out a string with the C code. And I can uh, compile that using GCC or something like that. The C code uh, looks like this. So it's very basic. It takes your symbolic uh, variables as inputs and, and computes the, the output. And there are some options how you would like to handle this data and stuff like that. But that's, of course, in an extremely narrow situation. We have a linear system we want to filter through. Very often, you're not that fortunate. And then uh, we have static compiler. And static compiler essentially can compile your Julia code to a small binary if you have written your Julia code as if it was C code. Almost. I have that within citation marks here. And what that means is that you do not have access to the garbage collector. So that's, a, of course, an extreme limitation. Julia is a garbage collected language. You can allocate that free, and you don't need to worry about uh, forgetting about that memory and forgetting calling free and so on. If you want this uh, compilation to work, you do not have access to the garbage collector. Uh, you can allocate manually, just like you do in C. You can call malloc, and that's fine. You can do that. And then you need to call free uh, to not uh, leak memory. I'm muted. Oh. Ah, but I'm, uh, this one is uh, unmuted. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, you are not allowed to um, have type unstable code. And what that means is that when you write your Julia code, you don't have to tell Julia what types of everything has. So say you have a function f of x. You don't need to tell Julia what x is, because when you call uh, the function f, Julia just looks at what the type is, and then Julia will 
try to infer the types of each variable in your function. That's called type inference. And if that succeeds, Julia can write efficient code. But if that fails, your, your program is still valid. It will just run a bit slower. OK, so it would be similar to if you have written it in Python or MATLAB where there is no type inference. That is OK in Julia, but that is not OK if you want to compile it. Because the, when you compile it, you must actually know what code to call. So you, you say A plus B. If the compiler know that A and B are integers, it knows how, that you need to call integer addition. But if it doesn't know the type of A and B, how can it possibly emit the code for A plus B? It doesn't know in advance before you actually run it. And a program where Julia's type inference cannot infer the type is called a type unstable program, and that's not allowed. So if you want to write high performance Julia code, you should avoid this anyway. So most high performance codes are type stable. So that's not a super strict limitation, but it's still a, a limitation. Yeah, uh, forget about Windows at the moment, just doesn't work. Uh, you can <laughs> completely forget about that if you are using Mac OS, uh, Linux, or if you, uh, you can use it on a Raspberry Pi, that works, but not Windows. And there is no cross compilation. So you, this requires that you can actually perform the compilation on the target device. So if you want to deploy your controller to a Raspberry Pi, you would have to actually run Julia and compile on the Raspberry Pi. And that you can do that, uh, but it's obviously not very ergonomic. So that's another limitation. Um, in some extreme cases, we do actually support cross compilation. So you can actually target an Arduino from your, you can compile on your laptop and target an Arduino, and that works with a lot of limitations. So you can understand the position that if you know exactly what you're doing and you're willing to accept certain limitations, you can make it work, but you need to, it's not ergonomic. All right, but having said that, there is a lot of packages to facilitate this. There is a package called Static Tools, and that contains a lot of the features to, to help you avoid using the garbage collector. So that contains tools for uh, automatic memory, or sorry, manual memory management. So malloc, um, bump allocators. So that's a way of saying that within this scope, uh, I allocate freely and I guarantee that the memory will not escape from here. And then you kind of get automatic memory management. And there is also things like uh, static strings. So a Julia string is typically heap allocated. And that's uh, the compiler doesn't like that. So if you want to compile something containing strings, you need to use the static strings package. So there are some facilities to help you do that. And if you can live with those uh, limitations, you can actually compile Julia code and run it uh, on interesting platforms today. But there is a lot of work in progress going on here, and that work is being done uh, from two ends. One end is this extreme, uh, we want to produce a tiny binary with just the native code, and that's what we will ship. And uh, the other end is that uh, we put all of Julia into a big blob. And currently that big blob is 50 megabytes, maybe 75 megabytes, and you ship that. And here's uh, your, uh, your uh, compiled uh, code, right? That also works, and the work being done on that side is to do what is called tree shaking. We want to remove as much code from this big blob as possible, so we only have the code that we actually require to run the application. So we, in the future, in the near future, perhaps we can limit the size of that blob you have to send to your customer or device or whatever. Uh, but if you use that approach, you essentially have a full Julia runtime with garbage collector and uh, parts of st standard libraries and things like that. So then you have access to the full Julia uh, language, uh, but the limitation then is that you have a kind of a huge binary and uh, uh, your platform must support Julia. It's not enough that they support the LVM. You must have some support of Julia. All right, here are some links with some blog posts. There is some guy who, yeah, the author of the package that targeted the Arduino. And here is a little demo I pro, uh, produced that uh, wrote a simple implementation of a common filter and uh, compiled it to a small binary and called that from a C program just to, to test out. And you, you can run that on a Raspberry Pi and so on, and it, and it works, right? But it's, of course, in a quite limited setting.
All right, there is a little demo in static tools. Uh, this demo computes and prints a multiplication table, times table. Uh, so here we see uh, one of the limitations. There is a C in front of the string that uh, makes instead of a standard Julia string, this is now a kind of a C compatible string. And then you can do stuff like uh, print. So print uh, input output works. You can parse the arguments from the command line. Uh, here we allocate an array and we have to do that manually. We say malloc array and we also have to meet that with a corresponding three in the end. So this is what I say that you kind of write C code, but in Julia. So you forfeit some of the nice automatic memory management. Uh, but if you're willing to do that, you can just write your standard Julia code here and it works. And then you call compile executable from static compiler. And that uh, gives you a little binary blob of a few kilobytes. And if you call that from the shell, it prints the times table, right? So stuff like that you, you can do. And you, I mean, you can implement anything in C, right? It's just a matter of how much uh, headache will you have doing it. So uh, will you uh, statically compile uh, a differential equation solver from the differential equation package? And no, you will not, uh, because that doesn't adhere to this subset of Julia that is amenable to static compilation. But can you easily write uh, Runge Kutta 4 in a way that is amenable to static compilation? Yeah, definitely, it's trivial. You can do that. Uh, so if you just prefer to write C code in Julia instead of in C, you, you can actually do quite a lot of things already today. All right. I wanted to mention also a number of online resources if you're interested. So this today's presentation is quite short and we have a lot of ground to cover. I've uh, recorded a little video series. There is currently 10 videos. It's the introduction to control system analysis and design in Julia. Sorry, I just need to. My voice always I never lasts for 90 minutes. Uh, it will not teach you control theory. It will just uh, teach you to use Julia for the stuff you already know how to do in Python or whatever. We have documentation for control systems. It's quite, um, yeah, it documents all the stuff you find in control systems. Uh, but uh, we also have Julia's in control documentation. There is a lot of tutorials there. We can actually have a look at it. Um, there is an intro. Oh. Yeah, okay. There is a long intro here, uh, but more interestingly is the tutorials. We have NPC tutorials. If you expand this, there is a lot of interesting tutorials here. You can have a look at. So this uh, covers not only the proprietary stuff, but also a lot of the open source stuff to put everything in one place. Uh, all right. There was a Julia course for the Department of Automatic Control in Lund. I've given it four times, I think, uh, over uh, since starting in 2015, I think was first time. Since it's for the Department of Automatic Control, it has some control stuff. <coughs> well, my voice really doesn't carry through 90 minutes. Uh, but it also covers like optimization, machine learning. Uh, uh, what else do we have in there? General Yulia workflow. Oh, please. <laughs> um, and if you go to this repository. If you go to this repository, uh, there are seven lectures. Uh, it starts with very basic introduction to Julia. We talk about types and functions. Mm. We talk about how to write performant Julia code. Okay. So if you come from uh, Python and you expect that if you translate your code to Julia, it will be blazingly fast, you will very often be disappointed. And the reason is that if you write Python code in Julia, it will have the performance of Python you must write proper Julia code. And that takes a while to get used to if you come from one of these uh, programming languages like Python or MATLAB. If you come from C, you will instinctively write performant Julia code. If you write C code in Julia, it will have high performance. But if you write MATLAB or Python code in Julia, it will have MATLAB or Python performance. And the reason is there are several reasons. In Python, we are not as used to thinking about how we allocate memory because we don't really have the tools to manage memory. 
So if you allocate tons of memory when you don't have to, you will have suffering performance. Mm. In Python, very often we need to work with, we need to do array operations. And if we really wish we could write the for loop, maybe we try real hard to write it in an, with array operations anyway, because the for loop is so slow. Whereas in Julia or C, you should just write the for loop. It's compiled, so it will be fast. So it takes a while to get used to this. Now I don't have to write this weird array stuff that doesn't feel natural because it, that's the only way to make it bearable. Um, so that takes a while getting used to this lecture. Also goes through what are the tools available to you to ask the compiler about performance related questions. So the most basic one is, of course, how do I properly benchmark my code? How do I time it? Uh, but also, how do I find which lines of code allocate memory? How do I find which lines of code take the longest time and so on? We go through that there. Mm -hmm. This uh, workflow lecture is similar to Christophe's lecture. Uh, his is much more <coughs> up to date. Uh, there is a lecture on distributed computing. So that's things like uh, threads running threaded computations on your machine uh, or distributed if you have several different workers. So I can run Julia on a cluster where I have many different Julia workers and they can talk to each other. So optimization and control and uh, the control folder here contains the two demos uh, that we saw today. And uh, if you want to see them hosted, you can click these links here. Uh, you get to, uh, I hope, yeah, here are the demos that I showed today, but they are hosted on uh, Julia Hub. So these are static, uh, meaning that if you try to move one of the sliders, nothing will happen. Uh, but you can click uh, run this notebook here, and then it will spin up a machine for you. You need to create an account, but it's free. You can use it for free for a number of hours every month, I think. Can you download it on your own computer and run it there? Yes, you can do that also. Uh, I think uh, you just, yeah. I don't know where the button is, to be honest. But if you click Edit or Run, there should be a button to download it. Yeah, you can do that. All right. We also have a list of webinars. Um, some of the they have a wide range of topics, uh, Julia related. But there are several different ones that are on Julia Sim Control, so model predictive control and, and uh, structured tuning of uh, tuning of structured controllers and things like that. So if you browse through here. They are all free, but uh, free. But I think you have to sign up or something. And uh, let's see. Yes, now we actually have time, so I'm gonna go through. I have one more demo prepared. Yes. Mm. So this is gonna be a little demo about uh, implementing a robust uh, model predictive controller using our tools in in Julia Sim. So Julia Sim is a suite of um, modeling and simulation tools that build on top of the Julia Hub platform. And they make use of all the open source things like modeling toolkit and Julia control and so on, but they add some proprietary stuff on top of that. And model predictive control is one such thing that we add on top. So let's see here. Um, we're gonna talk about the robust MPC and uh, there are a, a ton of different formulations of robust MPC. And when we say robust MPC in this case, we talk about robustness with respect to uh, parametric uncertainty. So since <clears throat> you are experts at MPC here, I don't need to tell you what MPC is, but our particular formulation of uh, robust MPC, it allows you to specify that the I have certain parameters, they are uncertain, and here are some possible realizations, and then it simulates uh, all the possible realizations. And it uh, guarantees that all of them satisfy all constraints and you can optimize the mean performance or the worst case or something like that. So here is a very basic case. It's an integrator with an uncertain gain. And the gain can be either 0.5, 1 or 5. All right, then if you are uh, wrong, then you might uh, uh, miss a constraint. There is a lower bound that is barely visible in the bottom of the plot. All right, and with MPC, we we simulate here in dashed lines and then we optimize and then we take a step and then we close the loop by just doing it again. So it might look something like this. 
So we see that the MPC controller internally maintains the distribution uh, over possible outcomes, uh, depending on the possible realizations of our uncertain parameters. Here we have one uncertain parameter, so you, you can have several. Uh, but in the end, it kind of converges. All right. Uh, yeah. To this audience, I don't need to motivate the MPC, perhaps. Uh, but uh, for the remote audience, uh, MPC is, has several nice benefits. One is that it naturally handles systems with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And many other control algorithms uh, are useful for single input, single output systems, but there is no natural extension to when you have multiple. It's also, and perhaps the primary benefit of MPC is that you can handle constraints in a principal way. So for instance, my input can only be in the range of plus minus 10 because physical limitations. Or this furnace is not allowed to be hotter than 200 degrees because then something melts. Okay, you always have such constraints. It's just a matter of can you express them or not and are they important for the solution? Uh, many times you want to operate very close to constraints because that's where you make the most money. Uh, but if uh, violating the constraint is associated with a high cost, you want to guarantee that you actually don't do that, right? And also MPC allows us straightforward to optimize an economical objective, so maximize profit. Uh, that's something we very often want our control system to do, but if we implement a PID controller, how do you maximize the profits? Yeah, who knows? All right. Uh, so to do this, we start by loading some packages. In this case, we load the Julia Sim control package and uh, the MPC submodule there, and some some utility packages. We're gonna control this uh, system here. It's a continuously stirred tank reactor. So here are there are two reactants inside of this. Here. Uh, oh. um, this stuff, uh, try to join. So. All right. There is a reactant A and reactant B, and reactant A is turning into reactant B. That's the purpose of this reactor. And it's uh, being stirred, and uh, there is a heating, or sorry, a cooling jacket. So this reaction produces heat. And the tricky thing here is that the more heat that is produced, uh, the faster the reaction gets. So it's an unstable system. You can exper experience thermal runaway, so it can kind of explode. All right, and if you're slightly uncertain about uh, exactly the dynamics, it's very easy to optimize and think that it looks great, and then actually you experience thermal runaway. So this is an example where uh, robustness is kind of desired. Uh, we have the system equations here. We're not going to look very much at them, but they are uh, somewhat nasty and nonlinear. There are some exponents in there and so on. We have four state variables and, and two inputs. All right. So the way we do this here, we specify some, some parameters. We have a, a number of state variables and control inputs and a sample rate. We have an initial condition, we have a reference perhaps, and uh, the MPC horizon. So this is the number of time steps into the future that we are predicting. We can specify some optional numerical scaling for the optimizer to like our system equations better. We discretize the continuous time dynamics here for simulation purposes using the RK4 method. The, M uh, the MPC controller actually uses a different discretization method. You can use RK4 if you want, but you can also, I think we're going to use collocation on finite elements here in the MPC controller. Uh, you can choose a discretization, there is trapezoidal and so on. So, um, we have some constraints. In this case, they are simple bounds on state variables and inputs, but you can have any complicated function of the of the state and the input as your constraints. Um, a cost function here, I specify a stage cost. So this is something that will be computed and added for each time step. And it's just uh, the squared abs to absolute uh, value squared of the error between the second state component here and the, the reference. Uh, we can have a difference cost. It looks a bit tricky here. It's because it allows you to be extremely flexible in what you penalize. So very often in MPC, we penalize the difference uh, of two consecutive control inputs. But here, this difference cost allows you to penalize the difference of two consecutive anything, uh, consecutive uh, outputs of any function, really. Uh, but in this case, it's just the input. 
And there is terminal cost saying that at the terminal time in each optimization uh, step, we, you need to satisfy this constraint. Oh, sorry, it's it's not a constraint, it's cost. You could have a constraint as well on the terminal uh, terminal step. We package all of our cost components into an objective. You can add additional cost components if you want to add more stuff to your cost. Um, yeah, we can provide an initial guess here. I just do some random random numbers. We define a solver and we accept any solver that supports uh, that is wrapped by optimization.jl. Uh, with some caveats, of course, if we want to use second order information, it needs to be a solver that actually uses second inform order information and so on. IP opt is a, a reasonable but not an optimal solver for this. Uh, it uses it can use the sparse Hessians of the Lagrangian and so on. So it's it's quite a good all round option, but it's never never going to be the absolute best one for MPC. Uh, but we can use it here. Uh, and then I say that my observer is state feedback. I can observe anything. But typically, your observer maybe is some kind of uh, nonlinear version of a Kalman filter or a particle filter or something like that. All right. Yeah, here I say what discretization I want to use in the MPC controller. I choose collocation on finite elements. There are others. You can use Runge Kutta 4. You could use uh, trapezoidal and, and so on. And you can specify some parameters here if you want. And then we just package everything into a problem. So here I just list all the stuff I created before. So my dynamics, the MPC horizon observer, and, and so on, right? And then uh, we can solve it. And the only uh, thing, the only objective we had here was the second state component should reach the reference of 0.6. OK, it did. It looks nice, and we're happy that we didn't violate any constraints. Uh, but here is the interesting part now. Now we introduce some small uncertainty. So if we if we have a 5% error in this parameter here, e, uh, yeah, it's hard to see what it's called, but it's the energy released by the reaction. Activation energy. Activation energy, thank you. Um, if we have even a 5% uncertainty there, and now suddenly uh, the uh, uh, the controller is uh, not stabilizing the system. It actually freaks out completely, right? And that's obviously something we would like to avoid because now maybe we destroyed our reactor. Uh, so uh, how do we mitigate that? Maybe we uh, design a robust MPC problem. So what I do here is I say, my parameters are uncertain. So I have now a vector of MPC parameters. So here I just say this is the nominal one, it's the one I had from before, P. But then uh, I just say if I set P at this component to be 6% lower and this P to be 6% higher, so now I have a set of possible P's. And then uh, I don't need to do anything else. I just pass in my parameter now is P uncertain instead of the P I had before. Uh, I, I need to also say that my robust horizon is one. That's essentially um, given the information you have at hand at a particular time step. Uh, if you don't know uh, the realization of your uncertain parameter, uh, no matter what the realization is, you have to take uh, choose one particular control action for the first step. Then for the second step and onwards, you have received new information. So depending on the realization of P, you're free to choose a different control action. So the robust horizon says, how many time steps in the beginning do I enforce that the control signal is constant for all the realizations? And typically what you should choose there is one, uh, but you can try to enforce additional uh, robustness by enforcing it for a few more steps. All right, and then when I solve this problem, uh, now I have a distribution of solution simulations. Uh, but I have a single solution. And here we see an interesting phenomena that my uh, state component, the concentration beta here on the top right, it doesn't actually reach the reference. And this, this can happen. So if we look at the control signals in the bottom here, depending on the realization of the uncertain parameters, you have to do vastly different control maneuvers to reach that reference. So what you do is somewhere in between such that you don't violate any of the constraints. And that means that you will never actually reach the reference. Uh, you see that all the 
no matter what the realization is, you could reach the reference if you knew which realization it was, but now you don't, so you never reach it. You stay at kind of a safe distance away from it so that you always guarantee that you uh, satisfy the constraints for all eternity. Now, if you would like to actually improve this situation and, and actually reach the reference, you would have to try to learn what is the actual activation energy uh, as you go along, right? You could learn that uh, from the data you observe as you as you run, but we don't do that here, so we never reach the reference. All right, yeah, and this is just a static plot of what actually happened. So this is just a flavor of how you can specify a, an MPC problem in using our toolkit, and in this uh, case, the model. Let's see if I exit this presentation mode. Uh, the model here came from a, a modeling toolkit model. So here it's just it's predefined in the package. So we don't actually see the, the code that builds the, the model. It just prints in this uh, LaTeX form. But we saw a, a flavor of or a hint of how we define a model in modeling toolkit using in the previous little example where we assembled a DC motor. So this uh, continuously stirred tank reactor is defined in a very similar way with the modeling toolkit equations. And then once we have such a model, um, this can extend. This is a still a toy problem in the sense that it has four state variables and two inputs. Uh, you can easily define models in modeling toolkit that has a uh, hundred thousand states. Okay, that's not something you would put into an MPC controller, perhaps, but uh, in in theory you could. Um, but it would probably be rather sluggish to to solve it. But modeling toolkit can be used to to build very sophisticated and realistic models of anything really, including uh, partial differential equations. So that's something that uh, similar tools like Modelica hasn't really targeted. Modelica is quite sophisticated at these lumped parameter systems where you say that, yeah, I have maybe a, here is a mass and here's another mass and it's connected by a continuously flexible rod, but I model it as a spring. So that's you lump all the infinitely many flexibilities along the rod as a single spring. That's a lumped, lumped parameter model. And that is quite successful for a lot of things. But if you have system, the bending cannot really be uh, approximated by a single component. Perhaps you have a turbine and this turbine flexes in a complicated way. OK, maybe you need to use some finite element uh, style modeling to handle that. And you want to that finite element style modeling to work together with your the rest of the system that might uh, be well modeled by a lumped parameter model. And then maybe you have a control system that is uh, Actually, it's not uh, a causal, it's causal. So you have errors in your block diagram because you, you measure something, you compute, and then you actuate. All of these things should fit together ideally in your simulation because your final simulation maybe needs to simulate all of these things. Modeling toolkit targets that kind of uh, realistic models. Um, so you can implement small models, like here's a DC motor with some resistors and uh, an inertia, and here's a PID controller. That's fine, but you can also do this more sophisticated and detailed modeling. So, in theory, this should work on that. But uh, obviously, as control systems engineer, we know that we have to make some model approximations if we want to use a model-based controller. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the detailed model is is um, useful when you want to validate on a more realistic model before you actually try to put it on the real system. All right. I think I have actually gone through all my uh, slides. Here are QR codes to some of the links.